my family worship center all the time because we these are uh, pretty good attendance nights for us both last week and this week and people uh, are are generally speaking fascinated with trying to get knowledge of the future witness horoscopes I remember horoscopes being in the paper when I was a, a young child I used to read them and horoscopes are still in the paper today I don't read them anymore but people are fascinated with that type of thing people go to tarot card readers uh, to try to figure out their future people uh, have their palms read if you go up to uh, Sedona uh, there are palm readers all over the place yeah. how many of you have been to Taos in Mexico yeah palm readers a lot of crystal uh, folks or the stand behind a crystal or you look through a crystal and they can tell you what's going on or some kind of mumbo jumbo. People are fascinated with uh, science fiction. I'll tell you, when I was lost, I read the book of Revelation. I was fascinated with the idea that there was a book anywhere that could tell me of the future. I really didn't understand it, but I read it because I read anything that, did, that had to do with uh, science fiction and I, that's what I considered Revelation to be at the time. But people all over America get on their phones, and what do they do? If they have a question, they dial 1-800-PSYCHIC-CRACKPOT, uh, and they, get, they call the, the psychic hotline, and they find out what's going on uh, in their future. If they actually pay somebody, they give them their credit card number and get abused financially as they get abused spiritually. But the idea of delving into the occult, uh, isn't anything new. Witness King Saul. He sought out mediums. He uh, sinfully attempted to obtain information about what was to come. It says that way back in Isaiah 8, 19, by consulting with the dead on behalf of the living. And anyone who knows the truth, of course knows. What, what can the dead tell you? You know what? The dead are dead. They're not, they're not telling you anything. But you know that the demons aren't dead. And the demons, like the idea that they can uh, try to interject themselves into those type of uh, situations, masquerading as the dead, they have a great opportunity then to propagate their lives. So, But all, all attempts to ascertain the future are really in vain. There is only one who knows and one who declares the future, and uh, that is God. In Isaiah, there's several uh, references in 44, 7. It tells us, and who can proclaim as I do? Then let him declare it and set it in order for me, God says, kind of uh, almost sarcastically. Since I appointed the ancient people and the things that are coming and shall come, let them show these to them. Notice the words, let him declare, let them show, saying, go ahead, if you're capable of foretelling the future, if you, can, if you actually think that you can prophesy, go ahead and show us. Later on in 45.21, it speaks to tell and bring forth your case. Yes, let them take counsel together. Who has declared this from ancient time? Who has told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? And there is no other God besides me, a just God, and a Savior. There is none besides me. And then still later, out of Isaiah 46, 9 and 10, Remember the former things of old. Uh, the former things of old would be referring to past history uh, and the fulfilled prophecies in that history. And then he says, For I am God, there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. And then verse 10 Declaring the beginning, the end from the beginning, he says, and from the ancient times things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. God has the knowledge of all things, past, present, and future. So the only place that we can really find truth about the future is found in the Scripture. Of God. In the Old Testament prophets, especially Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and Zechariah, provide glimpses of the future. 
And let's not forget Jesus in the Olivet Discourse. He speaks in regards to future events there. And Peter and Paul, and their inspired writings, speak of future events. But here, in this book, the book of Revelation, to man in the Bible, a book that unveils the future history of the world all the way to history's climax in the return of Jesus Christ, we have the future that we need to know, the future that we need to see, because the end is God's glorious kingdom, where we will reside with Him. So as John begins to write here, we will see him list what I'll call several characteristics of this marvelous book. We will review each of those characteristics as we begin the first verse tonight, and we'll see with the introduction that uh, there's several things, even in the first verse, that we can learn about this book. So, with your Bibles in hand, if you would open to Revelation 1.1, and if you're ready for the Word of God, would you signify that by saying, Amen? Amen. And if you're able and willing, will you please stand for the reading of God's Holy Word? <laughs> revelation 1.1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave Him to show His servants things which must shortly take place. And He sent and signified it by His angel to His servant, John. Thank you. You can be seen. The first characteristic that John speaks of here in this first verse in, is in regards to the book's nature. It's very essential nature. The first two words are important if we're going to understand the book in its fullest. The first two words, the revelation. This is, a, this is not some strange, some incomprehensible book of mystery. This is a book of revelation. To the contrary than to those that might teach that it's mysterious, this book has a very basic nature and desire of revealing the truth to us. Not to hide it from us. Not to make it confusing. Thus the opening words. The revelation. These are the first words in the last chapter of the story of redemption. And it tells us how it's all going to end. As with the creation, there's nothing vague here. There's nothing, nothing obscure here. There's nothing hidden from our view. No, God has given us a clear and a concise picture of the ending of mankind. I kind of chuckle at the idea that God would give us a clear and concise picture of great clarity from Genesis all the way through Jude. And then all of a sudden, he decided to to write it in an obscure way. God is always clear and He wants us to understand Him as best we can. Although in some seminaries and some theological thought think tanks today, there are those that picture a scenario where God is obscuring things from His people. I don't agree with that idea. Somehow these people have convinced, been convinced that Revelation's mysteries are so vague that the end is in some way left to confusion. I do not believe there will be any confusion amongst God's people. God's people will understand when the ending is taking place. They will understand the events that have taken place. The ones that will be confused are the ones that haven't accepted Jesus Christ, or the ones that thought they had accepted Jesus Christ, but have never asked them into their hearts. Those are the ones that will be confused. It's a serious error in my mind to think that Revelation is confusing because it strips the saga of redemption of its climax. This is the ending story. This is the end of what Jesus did. This is, this is, the, this is, like, this is like dinner without dessert. If you don't have Revelation, you lose your dessert. You've got to have dessert. Especially if it's chocolate cake. <laughs> And this is beyond chocolate cake. Now, we know the Greek word apokalupsis, which we've already discussed, appears 18 times in the New Testament. And remember, it's almost always used of a person, and it has the, the idea of removing a veil or to make something visible to us. Remember, we, we read last week from where Simeon said in Luke uh, 2.32, he praised God for the infant Jesus, describing him 
as a light of revelation for the Gentiles and to the glory of your own people Israel. Simeon exalts that the Messiah has been made visible. He has been apocalypsis to mankind. He has been revealed to everyone. Peter and Paul, we looked at last week, use that same word when referring to the revelation of Christ at his second coming. And thus, it is with this book which takes truths which have been concealed, and now it reveals them to us. That's all it's about. It's not any mumbo-jumbo. This is the Lord helping us understand the end times so we can be prepared and so that we can go out and witness to a lost world. As I said last week, the book is full of Old Testament references and it amplifies the truths of the Old Testament. The truths that were only suggested there are now realized in the personage of Jesus Christ, in His majesty, His glory, we sang of that tonight. And that's what this book is about. And listen to me, one day, all, even those that don't understand this book, are going to witness that majesty. They will witness that glory one day. This is the nature of the book of Revelation. It is to reveal. The second characteristic that I wanted to speak about this evening of this book, as we look at it, I want to look at its theme. While all scripture we know is revelation to us from God, what does 2 Timothy 3.16 tell us? All scripture is by the inspiration of God. This book is especially the revelation. The revelation of Jesus Christ. While the book is certainly revelation from Jesus, as it says in 22.6, it says, I, Jesus, have sent my eagles to te angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. The real intent here is that the revelation is about Jesus. It's from Jesus, but it's about Jesus. The Greek phrase that opens up here, the revelation of Jesus Christ, the apokalousis, Jesus in the Greek, we, which we translate the revelation of Jesus Christ, suggests John is making a statement that the, the, this verse is best understood as this is a revelation about Jesus Christ. You want to know who Jesus Christ is? You want to know Him intimately? John will reveal that Jesus Christ to you in this book. He wants you to understand that. And while the, the Gospels were about Jesus Christ, they present Him in His first coming, in His humiliation, while Revelation presents Him in His second coming, in His exaltation. Every vision, every description of Jesus in Revelation is one of majesty. It's one of power. It's one of His glory. And this unveiling begins in this very first chapter. And this is the theme of the book of Revelation. Now I'm going to chase a rabbit. It's not a real big rabbit. And I won't chase him too long. And it's not my fault. I'm going to chase him. I'll, I'll blame somebody else. But I once read something by a pastor named Criswell. And some of you might know. He was the pastor at First Baptist Dallas for I don't know how many decades for quite a long time. And he spoke to this idea, and I'm going to try to express it to you. I give him credit because it's his thought. But the first time our Lord came into the world, He came with a veil on. He did not, He was not revealed as He naturally is. He was veiled in our flesh. He was veiled in humanity. His deity was actually covered over by his manhood. And this was the way that Jesus had to come because he had to come as a sacrifice for me and you. But his Godhead was hidden underneath his humanity. Just once in a while did we see his deity shine through. Think of the Mount of Transfiguration. Wow. That was dramatic. Think of the miracles. Wow. Wow. That's where you've got a glimpse of that deity of who Jesus Christ is. But most of the time, the glory, 
the majesty, the deity, the wonder, the marvel of the Son of God, the second person of the Holy Trinity, was veiled over it, was covered over by the humanity that he took upon himself. His holy attributes, veiled, covered in flesh, and in reality, again, I mention our humanity, so he could be like us, so that he could be our substitute, so that he might become a sacrifice for us, his children. The Son of God, born in the stable. I believe growing up in relative poverty, a carpenter's son. I think Jesus knew what it meant to wake up hungry. I think Jesus knew what it meant to be thirsty. I think Jesus knew what it meant to wear the same clothes over and over. I think Jesus could sympathize with so many today in our society that feel downtrodden. Jesus was bruised for us. Jesus was beaten for you and me in his humanity. He had his beard plucked out. His, he wore a crown of thorns and bled. He was crucified and raised up as a felon on a cross for us. He was scoffed at by the world all around him. And the last time that the earth saw Jesus, as he was in his first coming, he was hanging in shame on a cross, in misery and anguish on a tree. Now later he would appear to a few of his believing disciples and other people, but the last time that this, the unbelieving world, would ever see Jesus when it, was when it saw him die as a wrongdoer. He was convicted. He was a wrongdoer. He was convicted as a criminal by his own people, and he was crucified on a Roman cross. And that was all part of God's plan. A part of the immeasurable, limitless grace and love of our Lord. That's what the phrase, by His stripes, we are healed, really means. Not what some of these televangelists will tell you it means. But then, is that all that this world will know of Jesus? Is that all that they will ever see of our Savior? Dying in shame on a cross? No, it isn't all that they will see of our Savior. Because it's also part of God's plan that someday this unbelieving, this blaspheming, this godless world shall see the Son of God in His full character. He will not be veiled in humanity's flesh any longer. He will come in all of His glory. He will come in all of His majesty, in full wonder, and in the marvel of the Godhead. Things that we don't even understand. Things that we cannot even comprehend. But one day, all men, all that have lived, are living and will live, all will look upon Him, Jesus Christ, as He really is, with His Father now in heaven. They shall see Him holding in His hands the title deed to the entire universe. Holding in His hands the authority of all the creation in the universe above us, of all the creation of the universe around us, of all the creation of the universe beneath us. Holding this world and its destiny, and every being's destiny in His pierced and loving hand. Then, all of humanity that has ever lived will understand who Jesus Christ really is. Okay. I'm done, I'm done with the rest. So, so, well, it's exciting. I don't know about you, but I get my office, I start hopping around in the office, I start studying. I start studying this. 
So that, that's the theme. The theme of this book is Jesus Christ and His majesty. This is a revelation into the majesty of Jesus Christ. The third characteristic I want to look at tonight of this book is found in the phrase, which God gave him, the big age. God gave this to Jesus. What did God give Jesus? Did God give him some previously withheld information? Well, it's not as if God finally gave him the day and the hour of his return. Return, because uh, if he did, it's not revealed to us in the book. And in Mark 13, 32, there's the inference that Jesus didn't know what was going on at that particular moment in his life. That's not, but that's not what the book, uh, when we look at it, that's not what it's talking to us about in this regard here. So for those that think the Father, Father might have revealed that to the Son, that very information that they think the Father might have gained the Son, it's not here. It doesn't tell us. We're just to be, we're to be wise in regards to things. And realistically, when Jesus was on earth, although it, the scripture tells us he had emptied himself, taking on the form of a bondservant, remember in his humiliation, in his incarnation, and it was humiliating for Jesus to come to earth and take on the form of man. It was. He had a reason to do it. And he did it out of his love, but it was humiliating to leave the glory of heaven. But uh, he set aside all of his uh, divine attributes. And it, but by the time of the writing of the book of Revelation, remember Jesus had already been ascended, what, 50 years by then? Somewhere in that, in that time frame. Jesus knew what was going on. So what was revealed here? Jesus was already fully God at the time of the writing of this book. He had no need for anyone to give him any additional information. I'll tell you what I think. I think that the book of Revelation is the Father's gift to His Son. This book, it says, which God gave Him. It's a far, in a far deeper and marvelous way is a gift from the Father to the Son. I believe that this book is a reward to the Son for His perfect, humble, faithful, and holy service. Remember Paul's words he wrote in Philippians 2, 5 through 11. He said, Let this mind be in you, which also, which was also in Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus who, being in the form of God, did not consider robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. Taking the form of a bond servant, a slave is the more appropriate translation of that word, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Then there's a very important word. There. Because Christ did this, therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. At that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on the earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, Jesus functioned in the way that His Father desired Him to, and therefore He was exalted. See, Christ's exaltation, promised in the last three verses we just read, is detailed in the book of Revelation. This is the exaltation of Jesus Christ. From the first chapter to the last chapter, you will see interwoven in this book the exaltation of Jesus Christ. It is, his, in essence, His full reward. I think of it this way, and I'm not alone, that God's first sign of His pleasure towards His obedient Son was expressed in His Son's resurrection. The second sign of God's pleasure in the obedience of His Son was evidenced 
in his ascension. The third sign of God's obedience, or God's pleasure in the obedience of the Son, was in his sending of the Holy Spirit, as he had promised. And then the fourth, the last sign of God's pleasure in the obedience of the Son is the book of Revelation, which tells us of his Son's second coming. It promises and reveals the glory that will be Christ when he comes again. This is the Son's, for lack of a better way for us to understand it, this is the Son's rightful inheritance. This is His. This is what He has been given. So, when we look at this, we can see that picture. Unlike most inheritances, most human wills, this document can be read by all. It's not a sealed document. You don't have to go to the lawyer's office to look at it. It's open for all to see. But remember one thing about this document. Not everyone will have the privilege of understanding it. See, we are privileged as God's people. Have you ever read any of the alternative books about what the book of Revelation is all about? They are some of the most far-fetched. <laughs> I don't want to say a word. I won't say another word. But they are so much obama baloney baloney <laughs> that you can't believe some of the ideas that man has come up with to try to fill in this picture. Because... Not everyone will understand. Only those that God unveils this truth to by His Spirit will understand it. And that's the source behind the book of Revelation. The source is God gave Him. The source of the book of Revelation is God. And then we'll look now at the recipients. We've looked at the nature. We've looked at the theme. And we've looked at the source of the book. And the next characteristic is the recipients. It's expressed this way in our text. It says, to show his servants. To show his bond servants. To show his slaves. Which was a word that a lot of the translators didn't like to use because of the negative connotation. But slave is the most appropriate word to use there. These are those that we just spoke of. These are those that have had the revealing that our spirit led and understand. The Father has graciously granted to a special group of people the privilege of understanding. Do you understand that you are privileged people? We are privileged to be children of God. You don't have the right to be a child of God. You're privileged to be a children of God. At Clovis Christian Schools Incorporated, we used to tell all our new students, we'll enroll you. We'll let you come to school here. But it's a privilege to attend school with us. And we expect you to hold up your end of the bargain. We expect you to behave a certain way. We expect you to be engrossed in the things of God. It is. John describes these people here. He calls them doulos. And that, that the word doulos is a slave. It's a slave who has come to the master out of devotion. In Exodus 21.5, it describes these types of the slaves. It says, but if the servant plainly says, listen to the word, I love my master first, my wife and my children. And they declare, I will not go free. Then the law prescribed for that slave that they would stay with that master. I believe it was, was it the year of Jubilee Day? That all slaves were released. After six years, in the seventh year, slaves were released. But a slave could say, no, I love my master. And that's who we are to be. That's to be our first priority. See, it's, it's exactly because of this reason that unbelievers find the book of Revelation incomprehensible. It's not intended for them to understand. I'm sorry, but it's not. It was given from the, from the Father to the Son to show, it says, to show His servants the words that John wrote there. It's to show us 
the servants, those that lovingly serve their father, those that, and those that refuse to acknowledge Jesus Christ cannot expect to understand this book. These are those that Paul wrote of in 1 Corinthians 2.14. But the natural man, he said, does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. I was a natural man when I first read the book of Revelation. I was fascinated by the angels and all the bowls and the, the wraths and the woes. Wow, I thought that was cool. I never had any idea what it means, but man, I was foolish. Paul says, nor can he know them because these things, Paul writes, are spiritually discerned things. It's the same thought behind Jesus' words of Matthew 13, 11 and 13. He said, he answered and said to them, because it had been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to them it hasn't been given. They don't can't understand the mysteries. And he continues in the 13th verse. Therefore I speak to them in parables. Because seeing they do not see. And hearing they don't hear. Nor do they understand. Unbelievers couldn't grasp what Jesus meant when he was teaching about present day spiritual realities. And unbelievers can't understand what we are trying to grasp. or what the, They can't understand future spiritual realities. Divine truth is hidden from those who are in the world until the Spirit comes to occupy them. The unbelieving skeptic often finds revelation nothing but chaos and confusion, and thus they try to make sense of what they, in, in essence, cannot make sense of. But to the truly loving, to those that are willing servants of Jesus Christ, this is an understandable book, and I believe when we, we finish this book, we will understand it to the best of our ability. The Lord will reveal to us what we are capable of understanding, and all the rest will just take on faith. Because we believe in Jesus Christ. We believe that He's our Lord, our Savior. We give Him our lives, and in this instance, we will believe what it is that we can understand and all the rest. We'll just go ahead and keep on keeping on. So, the, the, the fourth characteristic of the book of Revelation is that it is about, it is written to the redeemed, to the servants of Jesus Christ and His Father. And then the last area I want to talk about tonight is the emphasis of the book. The emphasis on future events in this book sets it apart from any other New Testament books. It's what makes this book unique, and that's the fifth characteristic of Revelation. It's prophetic uniqueness. As with all other prophetic lit literature, there's a dual emphasis here in the book of Revelation. Whenever you read prophecy, it always has two outcomes. In this book, we see Jesus Christ displayed, portrayed in His future glory, along with the blessedness of His saints but it also depicts the judgment of unbelievers in and by Jesus Christ leading to their eternal damnation. This is a book of judgments, and it is a book of doom for those that don't know Jesus. And while we might shy away from the dark side of that picture, it is never for one moment concealed in the book of Revelation. God is just, and sin must be punished. It has to be. Here we find there is no sentimental confusion as to what is right and what is wrong in the book of Revelation. There is no weak tolerance of evil in the book of Revelation. There is a mention of the Lamb that was slain, but that's followed by the wrath of the Lamb. There is here a river of water of life, but also there is a lake of fire. Here is revealed the God of love who is to dwell among men to wipe away their tears and to abolish death and sorrow and pain. But first, all of his enemies will be subdued. And then 
people wipe away our tears. Indeed, the revelation is in large measure a picture of the last conflict between the forces of evil and the power and majesty of God. The colors we will see are going to be bright. The colors we will see will be loud in the way they speak to us. They're going to be borrowed from the convulsions of nature. We will see how nature itself convulses up and comes against the evil one. We will see battles and carnage which the earth has never seen in this book. The struggle here will be titanic in nature. Countless hordes of demonic warriors are going to rise up in opposition to him who is the king of the kings and the lord of the lord. Upon them will be woes pronounced. There will be bowls of wrath poured out upon them. And there will be overwhelming destruction. The world has never seen anything like it. May we as God's people be ready to minister to all those that may be left behind at this time. May we try to educate them so they might come to knowledge of Jesus Christ. So that the Holy Spirit might call them to be a child of God. But after that destruction, there will be a brighter day. But before that brighter day, there will be incredible thunder before the dawn. Next week, I'll finish this fifth characteristic, and I'll go on with the other six more, I think, that are in the first verse. Thank you for your attention. Any thoughts? Any questions? Yes?
Yeah, and how many prophecies uh, came true about Muhammad? <laughs> or Buddha? <laughs> or Joseph Smith? What about Reverend Moon? Well, Reverend Moon's He's not dying. doing well. He's he died. He died. He died. He died. He died. He died. So what happens now? Who is the only person in all of 
them who sat on it, in which the heavens and the earth fled away, and there was found no place for them. Who was that? See, when, see, my problem is, is when I read a phrase like it says, God gave to him. See, I read that phrase and I say, right away my mind says, what did God give to him? Who's him? Well, to Jesus. I know it's Jesus. But right away I say, when I'm reading that, that first verse of Revelation 1, that's how I come up with all this stuff. And I'm not, I'm not unique at this, these, this idea of these characteristics. But when I read that phrase, God gave to him, what did God give him? So I go on a trip. This is the way I study the Bible. You, a lot of people ask me, well, how do you study the Bible, Steve? Well, then I go on a trip. And I try, and I try, I try to figure out, I sit in my house, it might take me three, four, five, six hours. I might, it, it might come to me to the, the, that night while I'm asleep or something. I wake up in the morning and I'll say, okay, now, I do, now, it, now it makes sense. And it's all because God shows me, I think, I hope that's the way it works. God is the one who is the sun. Yeah. So, so when I, so that's why, and that's why I use the word reward. Reward might not be a good thing. But I God, he was complete. Yeah. His Godhead was completed he functioned, by a sacrifice he, on the cross. He functioned in his fullness. And now, where is Jesus now? All you guys know this. Where is he sitting right now? He's in heaven at the right hand of the Father. What is the significance of sitting at the right hand of the King? Finish. What does it do? Now, a lot of us, we don't live in times of kings. But normally, the only person who would have authority to sit at the right hand of the king is the crown prince who would have been given that authority if the king had become senile and not able to sit on the judgment. He functions as the king. He functions as the king. He has the full authority of the king. God the Father gave Jesus a preeminent spot in heaven because of his completion on the cross, because of what he did for us. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Andy. Let's all rise.